Look at Galatians 4. We read it again. It's a passage that we've read over the last few years, several times at Christmas. Um, it's one that can easily be missed as a Christmas text if we're not careful because we, we often don't see it there in the Gospels. But this is Paul's opportunity to get in on uh, the Gospel message of Christmas. And I love it. He is speaking to the Galatian people who need to see that Christ really does uh, exalt, as he is exalted, lifts them out of slavery of sin and the law. He's showing us that Christ is the one that overcomes the law, and instead of having to live up to the law, we run to God's grace through not only the law, but the fulfillment of the law in Christ. And so look at Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 11. He says, but when the fullness of time had come, Underline that, the fullness of time. Underline those words, the fullness of time. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave but a son, if a son then, an heir through God. And so this massive picture that you're no longer a slave in sin, but now you've been made a son, what the scripture would call a son of righteousness, a son, um, a child of the most high king, being brought into the family of God and no longer an enemy of God. Now, there's a key term that is here. I want you to see it this morning. It's the term that we've already mentioned. In fact, there's three things that I want you to see. And just go ahead and fill these in. Get ready to move fast. Number one, we're going to see a key term. Number two, we're going to see a key time. And on the back side, you're going to see there, we are going to see a key task. So a key term, a key time, and a key task. Um, so go ahead and fill those in. But let's look at the first one there, a key term. And it's the term in the fullness of time. This term is used no less than six times in the New Testament, depending on how the, the, the Greek uh, letters and, and uh, form of the word fits together. You could say seven times, but certainly six times in the New Testament. And we see three of them here, really four of them here, um, in relationship to God's sovereign timing. Fill that in. When it says in the fullness of time, the big message here is, is that this is on God's timetable. This isn't on man's timetable. This isn't on history's timetable. This is all under the sovereignty of God's grand plan. In the life of our church, we often talk about God's grand plan, not only in the universe, but God's grand plan in your life, that God has a plan. And here we see that in God's grand plan, that it, it is being referenced that this timing means something. This timing means something to God, and it's for our notice. In Galatians 4.4, 4, which is the text we're looking at, and in Titus 1.3, we see that it's Jesus' birth. The phrase is used for Jesus' birth. But also we see in Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, this phrase is used not at Jesus' birth, but as Jesus' ministry begins. And so he's already grown, grown up, fast forward 30 years from his birth to the beginning of his ministry. For those of you who are new to studying the Bible, Jesus began his earthly ministry. He began teaching, he began fulfilling and saying, leading up to the cross, at the age of 30, he began speaking the truth of God in a way that was, okay, here we go, I'm going to tell you what God wants, I'm going to tell you who God is, I'm going to show you that I am him, this is when the miracles begin, and then he dies on the cross and rises again, fulfilling the debt, paying the debt for God's children. And so notice here with me in Mark chapter 1 and verse 15. I want you to see this. And this is after the baptism of Jesus, the temptation of Jesus, and then John the Baptist is arrested. So that's what comes before this, these two verses in John 1, 
Um, so this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and look what it says in verse 14. Now after John, that's John the Baptist, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. That is the good news of God. That's what gospel means is good news. So he, he begins by proclaiming the gospel of God, verse 15, and notice this, this saying, and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And what does he give? Two commands. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now this, this is, Mark records his first words that, that we know of as his ministry begins. And so he lifts up his voice. He says the time is fulfilled. He uses this, this term um, in the fullness of time. And the kingdom of God is at hand. He, I mean, the picture is this. Okay, it's happening now. The redemption part of history is about to happen. And it starts for three years of my teaching and my showing you that I am God. And then look at the next part. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, it's interesting that the word repent is used in the same, it, it's, you, it's sandwiched in between the word gospel. What did we say gospel means? Good news. Now, there's some people that think repent is a negative word. There's some people that think that repent is part of the brimstone, hellfire message, like genre, right? But I can say this, that Romans tells us that it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It is the, the kindness of God, the loving, the merciful nature of God that can lead us, that leads us into turning from ourselves to turning to Him. Now, we, we, we need to see that when a man or a woman begins to hear God's voice and begins to hear what God wants, He is to turn aside. She is to turn aside to God. There's many people in our culture today that they don't want to turn aside to God. They, they just kind of want to put God in the grocery basket as they're going down the aisle. And just kind of, just well, this is one of the things in my life. When God calls us, God calls us to see all of the rest of, of our existence in light of Him and not ourselves. And so the turning to God and turning away from the world, turning away from our sin, turning away from ourselves is a beautiful thing that God gives us the grace to do when he calls us to himself and our heart begins to hear his voice and we begin to respond to him. Some of you today are hearing this passage and you're saying, I need to repent and believe the gospel. I'm not sure I've ever done that. I wanna to say to you this morning, Christmas Eve would be a wonderful time for the battle to finally be over in your mind and heart. Amen. This would be a wonderful time for you to say, okay, no more, no more excuses, no, no more rationales that compete, no more things that I'm going to hold on to in my own life. I hear God's voice, I see his word, I want to respond as he gives me the grace to do. Friend, listen, by God's grace, you can turn to him today. Amen. If you will ask him for the grace to turn to him, if you will cry out to him and say, Lord, help my unbelief, help me to turn to you, help me to turn away from sin and self, help me to believe upon you, the Bible says that all who call upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. If your heart cries out to God, the question is, will you cry out to God? I encourage you, if you hear his voice today, do not turn that away. Instead, let today be the day that your heart finally says, Lord, I rest in you. I turn to you. I'm not going to hold on to loving this world or loving my flesh, loving the things that are around me, loving my pride, loving my pleasures, loving my sin more than I'm going to love the Savior who died for it. If the gospel is true, then, Lord, I turn to you, and I can tell you that the gospel is true. So, so notice this, that this word, the time is used, is, is for Jesus' birth, 
It's also for Jesus' ministry. And then, look at the, the last one that is here. It's for Jesus' sacrificial death. This is at the end of that three-year period. We see Timothy use this phrase when he begins to describe Jesus going to die for our sins. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 6. It's on the screen in front of you. Look what it says. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given, look what it says, at the proper time. That is at the time fulfilled. So at just the right time, Christ dies for the ungodly. That's what Romans says. Um, so, so we see the timing of this is, is, that, is that God has a grand plan, and his time is always correct. He has a fullness of time for that. He's not random in his timing. Now, not only does that apply to the grand plan of his work in the universe and his work in, in saving um, his children that are here on the earth, but listen, that is also true in your life and in my life individually. I don't believe that anything is random. I don't believe that anything is just up to fate. I, I, you know, we talk about good luck, you know? It usually, you know, that's sometimes a derogatory term. It's like, good luck, buddy, you know, hope it works out. You know, what will be is what, you know. For people who read the scripture, we see that there is a God who not only created all things, but orders all things, including time. Amen. And if you can begin to look and to see his sovereign, good, and glorious hand working through the things and the issues of your life, listen, you can begin to know the heart of God more, even when you see his hand, when you don't understand his hand, but this is glorifying to God that we come to trust him. And that's what a Christian does. And so I, I just want to encourage you. you. You say, well, that timing was pretty, that timing really wasn't very good. I, I mean, that wasn't a good time for me to lose my son or for me to lose my daughter. How, how can there be anything good with that? Will you run to the creator of the universe that saves us out of our sin? And friends, he can take the most difficult, the most frustrating, the most painful, the most tragic circumstances and in his grace turn them for his glory and our good. That's what he does. To us, they look bad. And to him, he's saying, no, you don't know the whole picture. I see, I see from the heavenly perspective. I know what I'm doing. Trust me and walk with me. Now, that's part of the sovereignty of God, his sovereign timing and his sovereign purposes in all things. Look at the second part here. Not only the key term of this, but the key time. I do want us to look at the time that Jesus came into the world, and this is kind of interesting. I love biblical background things, and part of the reason I love the biblical backgrounds is that it helps me understand the Bible. I, uh, how many times have you read a passage of Scripture and you've said, what does that mean? Why is that like that? I mean, that can't mean what it means, I mean, what it says. I mean, that, that's, that's bizarre to me. Well, listen, if you will just study the setting of wherever you are in the Scripture, there's much to learn about the setting that is there, both the setting within the text and the setting around the text and around the, everything from culture to um, the understandings of the day, the philosophies that are there. And that's what just basic academic study allows us to do in the Scripture. That's why we come together and we study the Word of God as a church family. We want to learn what it says. And so check these out. These will encourage you about what possibly is it that made this the fullness of time for Christ to be born. Why did Jesus come then, and why didn't he come a thousand years later? Or why didn't he come 2,000 years later, around now? Well, there's some hints to this um, that, that um, we've put together and that we can say, well, as God was moving through what we call the Old Testament and his work among his people in giving them the law and giving them the opportunity to see who he is, and listen, letting the law have its work of showing them that, that they're not God. 
of showing them that they're sinful and that they need a Savior. That's part of what the law does. It reveals to us we can't measure up. So the law is good in that it shows us our need for God. And so then we see the need for a Savior, and we, we see that God had worked it out, that around 2,000 years ago, Christ is born, and this is part of the process. I want you to see this. First of all, the key time, the key time on this is it was the right time politically. Oh, say politics and religion don't mix. Yes, they do every single day. Um, every single day they do. Um, but notice here with me, it was the right time politically. There was the Pax Romana. The Pax Romana means the peace of Rome. This means that the Roman Empire was really at part of it, it, its greatest strength. It had brought great peace. Now, granted, through the sword and through power, they had done this. But the Roman Empire had brought civilizations together that were formerly at odds with one another. It had conquered them and brought them into a great peaceful existence among them through their authority. And notice this, from Britannia, which is over in uh, what we would call Great Britain, all the way over to the Atlantic, all the way across Europe, and over into the Middle East to Mesopotamia, between the headwaters of both the Nile to the south and the Rhine to the north, so all of the Mediterranean world, all of up into Europe, this was a heavily populated, grossly uh, powerful empire that was there that would become very, very influential, and God chose to come at a time when this peace was there. Part of it was also this. Travel was unhindered. As the gospel would come and Jesus would, would come to die for the sins of the world and then rise again and ascend back to the Father and the church would be sent out, the church could travel. The church could get on ships. The church could get on Roman roads. Bridges were made. There, was, there were cities and ports built. There's a very practical reason why this was a time that made sense as we look in hindsight in God's great grand plan. Look at letter B. It was the right time culturally. Not only was there the military peace of Rome and brought travel, but culturally the world was more unified than ever before. There was far less difference between kingdoms. I mean, the Jews are a good example of it. They didn't want the Romans there, but they had to submit to the Romans because the Romans were in control. And in fact, they still spoke their Hebrew language but we know that many, many Jews also learn to speak some other languages too, like Greek and Latin and like Aramaic. We see this in uh, the life of Paul. Paul spoke, apparently he spoke Greek so well that a few times he was considered um, a non-Jew. And so here we see that Greek and Latin were common languages. The barrier of language was not there for the gospel. Look at the widespread education and commerce. So many people were educated. Many people, as they began to, they, they could read. And so the gospel letters are written. The Hebrew texts were, were translated. And as time would go on, many, many people could hear the gospel and they could read it and the gospel would even travel with business and commerce and trade. So it was the right time politically, it was the right time culturally, and this is interesting, the last one that is there is important. It was the right time spiritually. In the fullness of time, Christ was born because spiritually, God had been bringing together a world that though it was very diverse, it was increasingly fill it in open. You see, there were Roman gods and the whole views of Roman uh, polytheism. There was the God of Hebrew Old Testament Scripture, and there were some things changing in both of those worlds, and there were many other circumstances where there had been polytheistic um, views, and, and we can see this, that polytheism at this time was crashing. Um, emperor worship, singular emperor worship was starting to rise in the Roman Empire. That didn't last very long. But the whole idea of many Greek gods or many Roman gods, it had become really a joke. 
I mean, it had become more of a philosophical idea. People weren't, I mean, they, they, there, there was some time there where they were still offering a lot of sacrifices to the gods, but it, it had become much more of a ritualistic thing, and it, had, it was just in a time of crashing. And then in comes the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that there is the creator God of heaven and earth, and there is the creator God who comes and he gives his life for us. It's interesting that not only the polytheism was crashing, but look at the last one there, and this is important. The Jews, don't turn the page over, but the Jews had renewed interest in the scriptures. And there were two, there were two indicators of this. The first, right below that, the first indicator of this is John the Baptist's following. Do you remember with me when we were studying the book of John that, I mean, the crowds were going out into the wilderness to listen to John the Baptist? The crowds, I mean, they were mesmerized. They were seeking something different than what they were getting at their local synagogue or over in the temple in Jerusalem. That, that wasn't cutting it. And so as John the Baptist came along, there was a hunger, and John was preaching the gospel of God that we've already seen in Matthew, excuse me, in Mark, but John gets locked up. And, you know, that's interesting to me, too. Even, I was thinking about that this week, that, that Mark passage that I looked at, that John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, Jesus begins his ministry, and Jesus says, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. And John is sitting over there in prison. You say, well, that is just, that's just mean of God to take Jesus' relative, Jesus' Jesus's forerunner, and lock him up. And then eventually he gets beheaded. Listen, we're not going to understand all of God's workings out, I, I, perhaps, until we see the grand plan as we, as we get to heaven. In Scripture it says that we will know as we are known that there's the possibility that we're going to have much more um, insight into all the grand things that were there. I mean, it's, it's hard for him to imagine. John the Baptist, righteous man, preaching, forerunner of Jesus Christ, he's arrested and then eventually beheaded. But you know, the f idea is the focus wasn't to be on John the Baptist. In fact, John the Baptist said, um, John, um, Jesus is coming along. Are you threatened by him? And G John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. Well, he decreased right into prison. I mean, we, we look at that and we say, wow, the exalted plan of God is that Jesus is coming to save the world. There's not to be a rivalry between Jesus and John the Baptist. God knows what he's doing. We can trust what he's doing. We see that, that Christ loved John the Baptist. That John saw his fulfillment in running before Christ, preparing the way in the wilderness of people's hearts, and that's exactly what he did. And we see that the Jewish people were responding to that. They were coming out in multitudes, traveling out in the desert to listen to this man preach. And they were being, they were being baptized following his teaching. And so there was, a, there was a renewed interest in the scriptures. Not only that, but Jewish history tells us that right at the time of Jesus, that there had been 400 years between the last prophet's writing, the last prophet um, of Israel, and Jesus is coming. There had been 400 years of silence of Scripture. And there was a renewed interest, listen, among the Pharisees especially. The Pharisees had returned to the Word of God. The Pharisees were returning to the Scriptures, listen, intensely. And in fact, we see that with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was trained in the school of a very high a very highly regarded Jewish Pharisee. His name was Gamaliel. And I mean, Gamaliel students, they knew their Bible. They knew their Old Testament. And we see that God used Paul's great knowledge of the law, Paul's great knowledge of the prophets, Paul's great knowledge of what we call the Old Testament to use him as a proclaimer of the gospel after he would come to faith in Jesus. So what are those three there? It was the right time politically. Rome was powerful. There was peace. It was the right time what? What was the second one? Are you all there this morning? I know it's Christmas Eve. 
Let the sugar go away. Come on. Letter B, it was the right time culturally, and letter C, it was the right time spiritually. Very good. You're coming online. Let's flip the page and let's see. What is the key task that we see in this passage? So we've seen the key term. We've seen the key time. I want us to see the key task. The key task was this. We see it in the passage, but Christ was sent to save. Very simply, Jesus was born to save. He was born to die. That's what he was. He was born to be the sacrifice. If you see anything in this message this morning, if you see anything in this scripture, I want you to see that Christ was born to die for our sins. Look with me in verse 4. Look what it says up there in the box at the top of the page. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoptions as sons, verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So God sends his spirit into us, and it's his own spirit in us that cries out, Abba, Father. This is his spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are indeed his child, that he is indeed the Savior. God coming and doing a work in our hearts. God bringing us to salvation. Look at verse 7. So you are no longer a slave. You're no longer a slave to the law, but you are a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. God. I want you to see this, letter A, we see in these four verses, or three, these, yes, four verses, uh, we see the triune God in action. Uh, I want you to remember this, um, that Father, Son, and Spirit, He is triune, and we see all three mentioned in these verses. I, I want you to see what the, notice the passage on, on the scripture above here. In verses, in verse 4, it says, but when the fullness of time had come, God, that is the idea of God the Father, sent forth his son to be born of a woman under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption of sons. What's missing? The spirit. Look at the next part. Verse 6, and because you are sons, God has sent what? The spirit of his son into our hearts. So here's the Trinity working to bring us to salvation. The Father in love sends his only son. This is the great love and sacrifice of God. Who would send their son to die for somebody else? I don't think Jose Torres is going to send Alex to die for somebody else. You can rest assured I'm not going to send Cheryl or Andrea to die for somebody else. I I don't think Marty's going to send Matt to die for somebody else. We, we, we just, you know, who has love like that? God is coming, and he should, the idea there, listen, the idea there is he loves us so much that it's, it's beyond our comprehension in our picture. And when we come to find out that this son is God himself in the form of the Trinity, the, 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 the second person of the Trinity, we see that God is saying to you, to us this, I want you to see that I love you so much that I self-sacrifice my power, my position. I self-sacrifice all that I am in order to become a lowly servant that would willingly die for your sin because I love you. This is a powerful gospel. This is good news. The whole Trinity is involved here. Not only is the Trinity involved here, but look at letter B. This is the sovereign God in action. This means he, he answers to no one. He is that you, when you talk about the sovereign king of England, um, this is, or queen of, of England, she is in charge. I mean, this is this powerful figure. That's the idea of sovereignty. Um, we know there's limits in an earthly sense, but in the true sense of ultimate power, this is God. Look at letter B, the sovereign God in action. In the fullness of time, he's Lord over time. In the, he's born of a woman. Um, this is the idea that he's Lord over physical reality. Um, this is the virgin birth. He can cause a virgin to conceive. This is, this is 
Lord over the physical reality. We see that in the life of Christ when he stands up and just changes the weather with his words. We see that in the life of Christ when he sees a blind man that's been blind all of his life and Jesus speaks to him and heals him or Jesus rubs uh, a bit of mud, spittle mud on his eyes and says, go and wash, and, and, and he's healed. This is, this is Jesus showing us when he shows up at a little girl's house where she has died and says, daughter, arise, get up. And the little daughter wakes up. This is over and over and over again. We see this sovereign God in action, the God of the universe. And uh, th those three things that are there on the bottom, I, I've just added those. I, I love it. He's, he's Lord of time. He's Lord of physical reality. He's Lord of spiritual reality. He comes into our hearts, and he changes our hearts. All of this is going on through the beauty set in motion of Christian, uh, Christmas. Through the beauty of Christmas, it is all being set in motion that the sacrifices come to die. Letter C, notice this. In these passages, in these verses, we see the self-sacrificing God in action. And this is where the idea is, he sent forth his own son. We've already touched on that. And he sent forth his own son to redeem. That means to pay out, to buy back. So this is costing him something. This is costing him his life. This is costing him his son. And he does that at great cost. The one who should pay nothing pays everything so that you and I can live. This is a self-sacrificing God in action. Look at letter D. This is, we see, the merciful, generous God in action. He, he's, he's merciful. He, he takes those that were, that were slaves and he takes those who were sinful and against him and he says, you're my son. I make you my own. In fact, the very ones that would nail him to the cross, the very ones who would reject him and, and in our own, you say, well, I'm glad I wasn't there that day. Well, I'm sorry, friend, but spiritually speaking, we were all there that day. Our sin is what nailed Jesus to the cross. And God says, though you nailed me to the cross and you rejected me and who I was, I came that you might have life. I was lifted up and I cried out within the Trinity, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We had no clue. And in fact, for us in our sin, we have no idea how much we have violated the law of God. And yet God says, I take you from being a slave in this world's sin to being adopted into my family, the sons and the daughters of God. This is the merciful, generous God. Um, we go, and notice that in verse 7. Do you see that there in verse 7? It says, you're no longer a slave, but a son. But a son. And, and he, here he's, he's pointing out, if you're a son, that means you're an heir. And that means you are going to inherit the things of God. Now, that's not talking about health, wealth, gospel. Oh, great, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I get the cattle on a thousand hills. Most of y'all aren't farmers. That shouldn't excite you. But, I mean, the picture is this. It's not about stuff. It's about sanctification. It's not about all of the things of this world that you get to inherit. It is all about the, the tremendous grace and glory of God that he pours out on us in forgiving our sin and making us to be his children, making us ready for heaven. Oh, friend, don't turn that away. Don't turn away the, the meaning of Christmas. Don't turn away what Christ is, is inviting you to, to partake in, what Christ is inviting you to receive. You see, all of these, letter A, B, C, D, the triune God, the sovereign God, the self-sacrificing God, the merciful, generous God, all of these are representations of his radical love. This is radical love. The Bible tells us that God's motivation for all of these things was, was his love. In Romans 5.8 it says, but God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What was the motivation? God's love. He came and he did this 
to forgive us because he loves us. He didn't just say, okay, I forgive you by mere words. He came and he paid for our sin with his own life. So we see the cost and we see his love manifested. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. His motivation was love. This is radical love. And so radical love, follow this with me. Radical love calls us to radical conversion. God's radical love calls us to radical conversion. What do I mean by that? What I mean is this, is that if God has saved you with this kind of love to die in your place, then friend, our response should be nothing less than abandonment of everything that Christ died for. And and running in conversion to him. Now, only his spirit can do that in us. And we, the, the question is, will you simply come and believe and follow him in this and, and run after him in this? It is what it means to be radically converted to Christ. If you've never been converted to Christ, I call upon you to ask God, God, convert me to you. The things that Pastor Andrew was talking about right now, the, the, the things that he was talking about this morning, convert me to faith in you instead of faith in myself. Um, there's many people who come to church. There's many people, listen to this, who've even grown up in a Christian family, and they would call themselves, nominally by name, they would call themselves Christians. But they've never been converted to Christ. They're still subtly, quietly, very Sunday schoolish, still living for themselves instead of for Christ. And that's a, that's a very dangerous thing. I want to say to you that God calls us to be converted. And if you don't know that you've been converted, friend, you need to start asking God. You need to be asking yourself. You need to speak, be speaking with some other people and say, I'm not sure that I have truly been converted to Christ because the Bible tells us that those who have been converted to Christ know that they've been converted to Christ. That there is, there is an evidence of his spirit and our spirit saying that we indeed are the children of God. If you don't have that confidence, I would love to meet with you, whether today or this week or next month. I would, I would love to meet with you and talk to you about that because this is eternally important. Notice what it says there. Radical love calls us to radical conversion. And then look at the last one there. Radical conver conversion calls us to radical obedience. Jesus said... Those who love me are my children. Those who love me and obey me are my followers. He says this, if you love me, you will obey me. I used to say to Cheryl Ann and Andrea all the time, girls, can we hug Jesus? How do we show Jesus that we love him? And I would ask them when they were three or four years old, I said, can you hug Jesus? And they would say, well, no. And I would say, um, can you give him a kiss on the cheek? No. Um, can you wash his feet as we see in the Bible in these ways? Well, no, not directly and physically in that way. And I would say, well, how can you love him? And we would look at John 15, and we would see throughout all of Scripture, especially in, through the Scripture of, of the Gospel of John, that Jesus says over and over again, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will lo love those that I love. When you've done these things, when you've cared for the least of these around you, you're caring for me. When you love those who are in prison, you're loving me. When you love those who are poor, you're loving me. When you love those who are not like you, you're loving me. You see, obedience has everything to do with walking with God, and that's what actually shows that we are his children. Now, as we look at Christmas, I just want us to close with this idea. There are two great dangers in the manger, and I think that you'll, you'll get these right as I say them. The first one is this. There's the danger of underestimating the scene underestimating the scene. You know, when you have a movie, you have different scenes in a movie, right? 
there's this scene and there's that scene and if you go home after seeing a movie and you, you're talking to somebody with your family and you go, well, there's this one scene and, and, the, and you start telling about a scene. And you, you, you know, it, it was important to the storyline or it meant a lot, it touched you or it explained something. Well, there's this scene in the grand plan of God of Jesus being born in a little town called Bethlehem in a very, very humble situation. In fact, I'm going to say a humiliating situation. That here they show up in this town pregnant on a donkey and they go to the inn and the innkeeper says, no, we got this big census going on. Everybody's been sent to their own hometown. Um, There's no room here in the inn. And the guy looks at her and goes, wow, you look pregnant. Okay. I don't have a room for you, but I'll give you the stable. Now, I don't quite understand that either. I would hope most people would say, come on in. You know, my daughter can sleep on, or my son can sleep on the floor. You, 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 you know, you would think that would happen, but that's not what happened. Heart pretty closed, whatever. She goes to a horse's stall just so she's not out in the street delivering her baby. Friends, when God came to the world, he came in abject humility. Um, But we've made it into a cute little scene. We've put these little scenes in our in our house, and you know, it it, it's just kind of cute very often. Does the manger just seem cute to you? Do you realize what it represents? Do you realize what it represents? You may want to write out some thought to the side what it represents. What are some things that it represents? I've just mentioned one of them. The humility of God. The fact that the powerful creator of the universe humbles himself to a place of even being born in a horse's stall. And there's a grand lesson behind that. How about this last one? We can underestimate the scene by mistaking meekness for weakness in missing this whole grand picture. Jane Fonda... um, otherwise known as Hanoi Jane. Some of you remember that Jane. Um, I think the wife of Ted Turner, uh, the builder of CNN, happened to be um, standing next to the Archbishop um, of Canterbury, who is the head of the Church of England. Somewhere along the way, they were having a discussion at a party, and um, the Archbishop of Canterbury mentioned the fact that, you know, at Christmas we celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was born. Um, And Jane Fonda responded with, well, I don't believe him to be the Son of God. And and the Archbishop of Canterbury said, well, all of Scripture gives gives point to that very, very clearly. And, um, you know, I, I believe that The scripture makes clear that this is the case. And she said, well, he's the son of God to you, but he's not to me, is what she said. The Archbishop of Canterbury just looked at her and said, well, ma'am, either he is or he isn't. And that is the reality of coming to understand who God is and who God is not, and, and whether you believe it, and whether you follow it, and whether you recognize him as such. Um, that was early on. There was even talk, I remember when we were in St. Augustine, that perhaps Jane Fonda had become a Christian. Um, I don't know whatever happened with that. But I know the early indication was is that there is this picture, like many in the world, that would say in this relativistic age in which we live, well, that's good for you, but it's not good for me. And I would say that many would miss who Jesus is and mistake him as not being the Son of God as being, in fact, some type of a weak scene. But here's the difference, though. Weakness indicates a lack of strength. 
Meekness is strength under control. And when you look at that baby in the manger, that is strength under control. That baby in the manger is all of the power of God that could, that could obliterate all of the universe, instead coming into the universe as a helpless babe to show us his kind of love. That is a powerful picture for me. We should not underestimate the scene. There are many in this day and time that, that Christmas is just this beautiful, quaint little story of a baby in a manger, and they've never really thought through that. We shouldn't underestimate it. Number two, there's another danger in this, and it's the overestimating of yourself. You can either underestimate the manger, or you can overestimate yourself. Do you see yourself as worthy of this kind of gift? You see, there's some people that would look at this and just kind of say, yeah, yeah, I'm, I, I mean, even, even Jesus came in this way, and it's, you know, it's because he loves me, and it's because I have this inherent worth. And there's a lot of people that would say, what do you mean? You, you mean the Christian message is that you're unworthy? And I would say, exactly. That's not a very popular message in our day and time. In our day and time, it's all about you. It's all about your self-esteem. It's all about you having a positive self-image. It's all about this picture of, of your goodness. When, in fact, God is saying to us, in spite of who you are, I love you and I come for you. That is a glorious and beautiful truth. Look at the next part there. Do you see God's mercy and grace being poured out? That his mercy and grace is being poured out on us at Christmas. That he would come into the world to be our salvation, to receive us as sons, to give us the heirs, to give us as heirs his grace and his glory. So then we have to ask ourselves this final thing of overestimating yourself, I, the danger of that. What is your response? I want to encourage you to really consider carefully your response to Christmas, your response to the gospel. Because this could be the day, this could be the moment when you go, oh, that's why he came? That's what was going on there with the donkey and the shepherds and the hay that the creator of the universe was showing us how much he loved us, that he would become a baby, and that he would live 30 years to us silent. We don't know. I mean, we don't know what all he did during those 30 years. I mean, he grew up in favor with God and man. We know very little about that except we saw that he was responding to both God and man as he came. And then he declares to us the love of God and dies on the cross for our sins. What is your response to that? Um, I want you to notice these things on the screen. These are not on your outline. Have you received Christ as Lord and Savior? This, this morning I want to give you the opportunity to do that. Very simply. And notice these things that are here. One, what does it mean to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior? Number one, to recognize and believe he was God's sacrifice to pay for your sin. That this was God's antidote to your sin. This is the antivenom. This is what takes away the poison. Is that Jesus came to take the sting of death for you. What a beautiful truth. Have you received that? I encourage you that that's what it means to receive Christ. Look at the next part. To turn to him in faith. And what are you, you're turning, turning to him in faith away from self and sin. That means you're no longer going to trust in yourself and you're no longer going to just run in your sin, but you're going to say, no, the holy creator of the universe calls me to to live in him in faith. This means that you rest in him. To say, Christ died for me, 
I will live for him. I turn to him. And then how do we do that? We do that by prayer and trust in him right now. I invite you to do that. If you don't know that you know that you know that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, this morning I want to lead you in a prayer where I am inviting you to say, Lord Jesus, I need you. Today I want the battle to be over. I want you to be Lord of my life. I want to lead you in a prayer. And if that's your need today, that you would pray that prayer. And that if you know that you know that you know that you have Christ, you are praying right now for those who don't know that. Amen? Church family, did you hear what I said? If you don't know that, you're praying for those who are uncertain of that and may be being touched by the Holy Spirit right now. Would you stand with me for prayer?